sorrow the heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow the heaven can't heal. So lay down your Oh
Here's the table that you've prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is the table that you've prepared for me in the presence of my enemies it's your body and your blood you shed for me this is how I fight my
Hey Oasis Church friends and family, welcome to our patio on this beautiful evening. Um, what an awesome weather weekend we've had so far, huh? Um, just coming from a pretty awesome wedding and got to thinking about the transition times for a lot of people this time of year. Um, see, this time at Oasis, we we pause in our worship gathering to pray and not really pause like prayer is a part of our worship and we so value and recognize that if we want to see God move in our own lives if we want to see him move in our church if we want to see him move in our community it's got to start with prayer and so we pray together we pray together often and we are so excited that you have decided to join us so today as I was doing this wedding and as I was thinking about the transition times um, for a lot of people during this time of year, we have people graduating, we have people getting married, we have people moving into new careers, you have all different kinds of transition. And so we just want to spend a little bit of time praying for that. And when I was transitioning out of high school into college, uh, my parents got me a Bible and inside the Bible, um, my dad wrote a quote, and so I just want to share that quote, and then I want to invite you to pray for all of those who are graduating, who are moving um, from high school to college, or from college to career, or to graduate school, or on for your doctorate, whatever you're doing. Um, we just want to pray for those who are transitioning out of one season into the next. So my dad wrote inside my Bible a quote from St. Augustine that says this, to my God, a heart of flame, to my fellow man, a heart of love, and to myself, a heart of steel. And so that is my prayer for you, that, man, your, your heart would be on fire for God, and that you would have this heart of love for those around you, and that for yourself, you would be strong and courageous because of who God is in your life. And so if you have a graduate, I would encourage you to maybe lay hands on them and pray for them. If you know somebody who is graduating, I would encourage you to pray for them as well. Um, but we have several at Oasis that are graduating and um, let's just spend some time praying for them. So I'm going to pray and then I'm going to leave some time for you to pray. And then we will, uh, Joel will wrap that up, wrap up that prayer time and we'll get into uh, looking into the next couple of chapters of Matthew. We'll continue our journey in the Gospel of Matthew. So let's pray, and then I'll leave some time for you to pray. God, thank you for this this season of kind of the closing of one chapter and the beginning of the next. And God, I just pray that you would be with each one of our graduates at Oasis and all the schools represented at Oasis, that you would just bless and encourage each young man, young woman who is taking uh, this step of courage, and maybe it's unknown, maybe there are some question marks, maybe there's some, I don't know what's next, but God, I pray their confidence would come in knowing that you are in control. So God, whatever next steps are taken, I pray that you would bless, I, play, I, I pray that you would encourage, I pray that you would lead the way, I pray that each one of these graduates would just be obedient to the call that you have on their lives, and that no matter what step they take, they would keep you absolutely first in every area of their lives. So God, we just pray that your anointing would be on them, we pray that your blessing would be on them, we pray that everything that they knew next um, they would do in confidence and that they would do in courage and that you would lead them every step of the way. So God, just hear our prayers as we lift our graduates to you. So spend some few moments praying for our graduates and then Joel will wrap up our time together.
Father in heaven, thank you for our graduates. Uh, thank you for the work that they've done uh, to get to the place they are now. Um, and I pray for your blessing on them uh, as they, uh, they go from wherever they are to the next steps. Whether they're staying here, whether they're going off to school or to start off a new career, what, whatever their next steps are, I pray that you would be with them, that you would prepare the way so that they could serve you and serve others um, in whatever capacity you are preparing them for, you have prepared them for, uh, and that they could glorify you in whatever they do. I pray that we would continue to support them, to love them, to reach out to them. Uh, they wouldn't feel alone or or confused, or they would feel loved and surrounded um, by friends and family. And I just I pray that they would stay strong and solid in their faith, that they would continue to, to lay the foundation of your words, what you have said is good and right and beautiful. I pray that that would be what they seek. And I pray as we open up your word together, um, I just pray that you would show us your heart for people, that you would show us uh, your heart, uh, what you want us to do in relation to the people around us uh, and the people that aren't around us. Um, I just pray that you would reveal that to us, that we would trust your word and we would obey your word. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, hey guys, my name is Joel and I am part of the team here at Oasis and I'm glad uh, that you are tuning in to Oasis Online, whether you're at home or uh, with your family or maybe at one of our house churches. Uh, we are going to continue to study the book of Matthew together. Um, and as uh, we have been studying the book of Matthew the past couple weeks, we've been really focusing on uh, the fact that the book of Matthew uh, was written by a Jewish author and it was written to a Jewish author audience. And we've been focusing on a few different themes along the way, um, but we are going to be going through three different chapters, chapters 8, 9, and 10 today. So we have a lot of ground to cover. And uh, in the immortal words of Aerosmith, I don't want to miss a thing. I want to get through everything today. So we're just going to jump right in. We're not going to spend a lot of time introducing things today. Um, but so we're going to start in Matthew chapter 10 verses 34 through 36. This is at the end um, of the, the greater passage we're looking at today. But we're going to start at the end and kind of see uh, what brought us to this point. Um, these might be some familiar words. You may have heard them before. This is Jesus speaking. He said, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. This is, uh, this is an intense passage. Like, okay, Jesus, you didn't come to bring peace? Like... I mean, even if you are going to justify war for whatever reason, everyone wants peace, right? Like, this seems hard, especially for people who, who uh, have experienced the horrors of war themselves or, or uh, just know about history. Like, this seems kind of strange. Um, this is a difficult passage, but, but whatever this passage is saying... It is clear that Jesus was coming to do something new. That he was coming to do something revolutionary. That it would be so revolutionary that it would turn family members against one another. These are the kinds of passages of scripture that, that, that make me feel uncomfortable. I mean, you just kind of want to be like, okay, let's, uh, let's get on with the, uh, the good stuff, Jesus. Can we just kind of skip over this and, you know, talk about loving your neighbor and, um, you know, the healings, those are really fun and cool and, and, and all that. Can we, can we look at that? Like, these are, these are difficult passages. Um, and, and I think a lot of us get uncomfortable with these, but sometimes I think when we read these passages, we just kind of turn our brain off a little bit. We just kind of let our eyes glaze over for a minute because a lot of us, if you grew up in American Christianity, like me, 
we, we haven't been encouraged to ask questions. Like questions uh, aren't necessarily a good thing. Um, so so you kind of just been conditioned to be like, if I don't understand something about the Bible, I'm just going to ignore it. Um, but actually, I think these difficult passages can be some of the most rich and rewarding passages of Scripture. That when we really dig in to, to see what it's saying, um, that we're going to be rewarded. And, and I think it's important that we learn to, to ask questions of the Bible. Yeah, there are some difficult passages. And sometimes Jesus said stuff or that, that seem to contradict other parts of Scripture. I don't think they actually do contradict, but on the face value, they seem to do so. But, but when we, in my experience, every time I've just come to the Scripture honestly and, and honestly studied and researched and prayed, um, the seeming contradictions um, have proven to just not be contradictions, but just allow me to see Scripture even deeper and understand even more of what God is doing. So I do think we need to learn to ask these questions. Uh, but we're actually not going to answer the questions right now. I'm going to leave you guys, leave you guys hanging, and we're going to go back uh, to chapters 8 and 9 in the first half of chapter 10 um, to just kind of give some context to this, this passage. And as we look at chapters... 8 through 10, we're kind of going to do an overview. Um, so in chapter 7, Nate just finished up last week preaching on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' first major teaching in the book of Matthew. Um, and, and as soon as the Sermon on the Mount is done, as soon as chapter 7 is done, Jesus jumps right into ministry. And these are some of the stories that a lot of us are familiar with. Like Jesus' stories of, of healing people and calling his disciples and, and, um, and, walk, and not walking on water yet. Uh, and calming a, a raging storm, all that kind of stuff. These are familiar stories. But... but uh, they're not just nice stories about Jesus healing people, although that's great. Um, there's more going on here. So as we look at chapters 8 and 9, we're just going to trace three different themes that are coming through all these different different stories. So the first theme we're going to look at is the theme, the theme of faith. Um, this story, and actually in chapter 8, we see the first time Matthew uses the word faith. And um, the word is used over and over again in chapters 8 and 9. And then it's not used again for a while in the book of, book of Matthew. So this is just a cluster of stories about, about faith. And if you read along with us last week or if you've heard these stories um, before, uh, one of the phrases Jesus uses is going to be familiar. After he heals someone, often he'll say, your faith has made you well. Now we're going to read one of those stories now. Matthew chapter 9 verses 19 through 22. So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. Just then a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe for, for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that moment. I just love this story so much. I mean, if you know anything about the, the context, like this woman had this issue of bleeding for 12 years. 12 years she was struggling with his medical condition, but it was more than a medical, medical condition for the Jewish people. Um, you know, they had all these ritual purity laws in the Old Testament, which it's a whole nother story, really cool and interesting stuff. Um, but basically, uh, with this issue of, of bleeding, she would have been ritually impure. And so she couldn't go and offer sacrifices. She couldn't go to the temple. She couldn't do all of these things because of, of her ritual impurity. And that doesn't necessarily mean she had sinned, but, but she had to be ritually clean before she could go uh, to the presence of God and, and all that kind of stuff. And so um, either way, uh, she was ritually impure. And, and also, um, for some ritual impurities, if you touch the person, you would be ritually impure yourself as well. And, and so there was all this stigma 
uh, around blood and ritual impurity and all this stuff, all that stuff adds up. And this is an oversimplification, but all that stuff adds up to the fact that because of this, this medical condition she had, she would have been an outcast in society. She wouldn't have been um, welcomed in most areas of society. And so she had this 12 years of desperation building up to, to the point where she reaches out in desperation to touch Jesus's robe. But there's more layers there because it, it's not just, you know, in our society, you don't just touch strangers. Like that's weird. And it was true then too. Like that's, why would you do that? Um, but also there was, you know, the ritual impurity layer of uh, the fact that she was a woman, like a woman touching a man, like in public, like that is not good in their society, much more patriarchal society and genders uh, were much more separated. Like in the synagogues, uh, the women would sit on one side and the men would sit on the other side, like very separated by gender. Um, but there's also the social status thing going on. Like she was an outsider, an outcast, and Jesus was a rabbi. Like you wouldn't just touch a rabbi in the street. Like there's so many layers here that, that point to the fact that this lady was desperate for Jesus to heal her. And that's what causes her to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. And then Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Huh. I think that statement is encouraging for a lot of us. Like, you, like all I need is faith. All I need is faith in Jesus to be saved. That's all that matters. Just faith. I don't have to work hard. I don't have to do it. I just need faith in Jesus. And that's good. But I also think that this statement could be discouraging for some people. Like, you look at that and think, I don't have... I don't have that much faith like this woman. Or, or you look at the circumstances in your life. Maybe you have been struggling with a medical condition for years. Maybe you have, um, you know, you struggle with relationships or, or job stuff or whatever it is. And you look at the situation in your life and say, I, I thought I had faith, but maybe my faith isn't strong enough because all these things are still going on. Um, so let, let's talk for a few minutes about faith. I mean, even in the English language, the word faith is used in a lot of different ways. I mean, you could say, I have faith in UFOs. And if you, you know, have been watching the news lately, maybe that's not as crazy as it was a couple months ago. Um, maybe you say, I have faith in my auto mechanic. Maybe you would say, I have faith that I ate oatmeal for breakfast this morning. Like, all of those have different layers of meaning. Um, faith isn't just belief in the Bible, like just believing that God exists. It's a lot more than that. And, and so um, as I think about those examples I gave earlier, I think we can think about kind of two main components of faith. There's, there's confidence, like how sure you are that something exists. There's that element, confidence, but there's also commitment or trust. Like how much you trust or how, how willing you are to commit your life to that person or to that thing or whatever it may be. And I think both of those are on a spectrum. So, you know, compare my faith in UFOs to my faith that I ate oatmeal this morning. Like I'm completely confident that I ate oatmeal this morning. Like I know, yeah, I ate oatmeal this morning. I just happened a couple hours ago. Like I know that that's true. Now. I don't actually believe in, in like aliens and stuff, but maybe if I did, I would say I have faith in UFOs, um, but I probably wouldn't place the same level of confidence in that belief as in um, the belief that I, of, of what I ate that morning. Like I know what, that that's true. I'm not the same level of confidence, maybe pretty confident, but not the same level of confidence. Or there's also the element of commitment, which is also, on a spectrum. Like I've got to have trust in my auto mechanic. Like, like I, I'm just, I'm not a handy person. I'm not, I don't know anything about cars. So I've got to trust my mechanic. Like if I were to go take my car to the mechanic with a clicking sound and the, the, the light wasn't even on, the engine light wasn't even on, uh, and the mechanic said, you know, you've got a transmission issue. Uh, it's blown. You're going to have to get a brand new transition. It's going to be $2,000. Like I would have 
no context for knowing whether that was true or not. I would have no way of knowing how to even check to see if that was true. So, so I've got to really trust my auto mechanic that, that he or she is telling me the truth. Um, and in, this, in the same way, I might need trust or commitment for my auto mechanic. I don't need trust in the belief that I ate oatmeal this morning. Like that doesn't really matter one way or the other. Someone could point a gun to my head and tell me to defend that statement and I would have no problem lying about it. Like I don't, I don't have any level of commitment to that belief. So we've got just a spectrum of, of commitment, just like we have a spectrum of confidence. So the question is, when the Bible talks about faith, is the emphasis more on your level of confidence or is it more on the level of commitment? Well, let's read a passage of scripture that later on in the book of Matthew when Jesus is talking about faith. Matthew 17 verses 19 through 20. It says, Afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, Why couldn't we cast out that demon? You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Faith as small as a mustard seed. I think this is an encouragement for those of us who don't feel like we have very much faith. We don't feel like the woman who, who is so desperate, she reaches out to grab the hem of Jesus' garment. Like, we don't feel like that. But, and these disciples, they must not have had very much faith. Like, Jesus said you didn't have enough faith. I'm thinking they had, like, no faith. Because Jesus said you just need faith as small as a mustard seed. That's all you need. This is an encouragement to us that we don't have to be completely and totally confident. Like, it's okay. It's okay to have questions, like we talked about before. That's okay to have questions, to not have all your questions answered. Jude 22 says that we must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Like, we need to, to, to have room in our communities for people who are still have questions, still have doubts, they're still working stuff out. The point is, are we committed to Jesus? Do we trust Jesus? That's what faith does. It moves us to action. When Jesus, we're about to read this story in a few minutes, but um, Jesus heals a paralyzed man. And Matthew says that when, when Jesus saw uh, the faith of his friends, um, Jesus... Uh, that's when he forgave his sins. That's what moved Jesus to act, is he saw their faith. The point is that faith is something that you can see. It's not just something that's going on in your head, but it's something that moves us to action. It's trust. So that's the first theme we see in these few chapters. The next theme is the authority of Jesus. So to understand this theme, we've got to understand how the entire book of Matthew is organized. So in the book of Matthew, there are five major chunks of teaching of Jesus. Maybe you could call them sermons or teachings, but five big teachings, long teachings of Jesus. And um, Nate just finished preaching on the first one last week. The Sermon on the Mount is the first big teaching of Jesus. And the next one... Uh, begins in Matthew chapter 10. So chapters 8 and 9 are sandwiched between these two major teachings of Jesus. And so these teachings kind of frame Matthew 8 and 9, but it's interesting how Matthew frames these teachings. So the end of chapter 7, after the Sermon on the Mount is done, we're told that the crowds were amazed at Jesus' teaching because he taught with real authority authority, quite unlike their teachers of the religious law. Religious law. And, then, and then at the beginning of chapter 10, at the beginning of the next um, major teaching of Jesus, we're told that Jesus gave authority 
to his disciples. So authority is what is framing uh, these stories in Matthew chapter 8 and 9. And as you read chapter 8 and 9, you hear that word authority said over and over again. And Jesus, um, it's not that every single story in these chapters explicitly uses the word authority, but it's, it's in the ones that don't, it's, it's in the background as well. Jesus demonstrates his authority over sickness when he heals, you know, the, the lady with the blood, the, the, the blind man. He heals the paralyzed man. He heals all these people. He, he demonstrates his authority over nature itself when he calms the raging sea. And then again, Matthew uses this, uses this language of authority. He, he says that Jesus rebukes the, the waves and that the waves obeyed him. And then Jesus also demonstrates his authority over the spiritual realm when he casts out demons in these chapters. But we're going to read one specific uh, story, Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. Some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, my child. Your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves, That's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up and went home. Fear swept through the crowd as they saw this happen. And they praised God for giving humans such authority. So you got to understand in this story that in the Jewish world, no one had authority to forgive sins. Only God had authority to forgive sins. So when Jesus proclaimed the forgiveness of this man's sin, he was standing in the place of God. And that's part of the, the, the point of the book of Matthew, is that Jesus, the, the Messiah of Israel, is God in the flesh. And, and so Jesus is standing in the place of God. And these people are saying, who does this man think he is? And he says, to prove to you that I have the authority to do this, I'm also going to heal this guy. And so he heals the man. So Jesus has the authority of God himself. He is sovereign over all creation, over all the universe. And the question becomes, what does Jesus do with this authority? And so that brings us to the last theme in these chapters. And this is a theme we've seen, I, I'm pretty sure we've seen this every single week in the book of Matthew. And I hope that you get this point. The that the ministry that Jesus has, the gospel of the kingdom of God, is for the outcast, is for the outsiders in society. Time and time again in these chapters, the people that Jesus ministers to, they were ritually unclean, the, the leper and the woman suffering from the issue of blood. They were sinners and tax collectors. Um, Jesus heals the, surf, the servant of a Roman centurion, a non-Jewish person, and he was you know, a part of the Roman Empire that was oppressing the Jewish people. He heals the demon-possessed people. On and on and on we could go. His ministry is to the outcast in society. So what, what is Jesus doing here? Jesus is creating a new scandalous community. The, the people of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew puts it. It's a ragtag ragtag group of Jesus followers from the outskirts of society, the downtrodden, the, the downbeaten. Like throughout all the Bible, God has a special regard, a special preference, not preference, that's not the right word, but a special care for those who are on the outskirts of society. And Jesus is enacting this that has been there since the beginning. He's enacting this in his proclamation of the kingdom of God. So that brings us back to the very end of the book. Um, the very end of, not the very end of the book, of, of chapter 10. What we read at the beginning of the, this, 
the sermon that, that Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. What did Jesus mean by this? Well, let's be clear first and foremost. His statement is not a justification for violence. And I know sometimes it's quoted that way. Uh, we could have a conversation about you know, self-defense and, and the justification for war and things like that in the Bible. I love that conversation one day. Um, but this passage, what this verse is saying is not a justification for violence. And I don't, I just don't know how else to say it, but like if you think that's what this saying, I don't think we're reading the same book. I mean, I mean, the rest of the book like this is the same guy who said if you're hit on the face turn the other cheek love your enemies at the end of the the story when jesus is unlawfully arrested and like uh his his disciple peter he he takes he draws a sword and he cuts off a guy's ear and jesus rebukes peter specifically for drawing a sword and then he heals the guy's ear like this is this is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is coming to preach an upside down kingdom. And we'll get to that in a minute. But but I, I kind of, I, I was a little unfair of me at the beginning of this sermon. I read the, or I read this verse out of context. So you got to understand the context of this verse to understand what it means. Um, the, the immediate context and the context from the, from the, the, the bigger context from the rest of the book. But... The immediate context is this is this is a part of Jesus's one of Jesus's major teachings. And in this teaching in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is sending his disciples out on mission. So so he gave them a, a, a foundation with the Sermon on the Mount, like this is what my kingdom looks like. And then he shows them practically speaking. This, this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to cleanse the leper. I'm going to cast out, you know, all these demons. I'm going to do all this stuff. And then in Matthew 10, after you've seen what it looks like practically, now you go. It's your turn. And so he gives authority to the disciples. And he says, I give you authority to, to heal the sick, to cast out the demons, to do all this stuff. And now I want you to go do it. And so he, he tells them, this is how you're going to do it. But then he says... Here's the catch. You're not going to be very popular. This isn't going to go very well for you. <laughs> like, uh, people are going to spit in your face. People aren't going to receive you. Uh, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be brought before courts. All this stuff. It's not going to go over very well. Not very many people are going to like it. And that's the context in which he said, I came not to bring peace but a sword. That, that the message of the kingdom of God is not going to be popular. That's just the simple truth. It's not going to be a popular message. People aren't going to like it. And it is going to divide families, father against son, daughter against mother, all this stuff. Families are going to be divided over it. And then he continues. This is the rest of the passage. Uh, chapter 10, verses 37 through 39. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Listen to that. If you love your father and mother more than, than Jesus, you're not worthy of being his. This is the highest commitment that you could think of. In that context, not as much in our day, but it's still, you know, family ties are still important to us. But in that context, family was everything. It was everything. You have to love Jesus more than even your own family. That's the level of commitment that Jesus is calling his, calling his followers to. Uh, and that's part of what faith means, is that we are committed to trusting and following Jesus no matter what, no matter the cost, no matter whether we have to take up our cross and follow him. This is the upside down kingdom. Even when you're being unlawfully, unjustly executed, take up your cross and follow Jesus, whatever that looks like practically in your life. So, so what Jesus is doing here is he's making a new identity for the people of God. It's not about 
you know, for them, it's not about being Jewish. It's not about how religious you are. It's not about your social status or your political persuasion or, or how good you are at keeping the commandments of God. That's not who the people of God are. The people of God are the people who have faith, who have faith in Jesus as their Messiah. That's who the people of God are. And the people who have faith, what they look like, it's usually going to be these people on the outskirts of society, the outcasts. That's the people who are going to follow Jesus. And I've, I've wrestled with this over the past, the past week as I've been praying and, and studying this passage. Do we, do I reach out to the outcast? What does our faith community look like? Jesus was, was creating a brand new, scandalous new community of followers of God. He was building, inaugurating the kingdom of heaven, which was going to be for everyone from all tribes, tongues, nations, from all over the outcasts of society. Does our church look like that? Do we have the outcasts at our church? And how have I reached out to those people? And as, I mean, if I'm going to be honest, I don't think we look like, generally speaking, a ragtag group of Jesus followers. Um, and I think we could do a better job at reaching out to those people. Sure, like if someone, if an outcast in society comes to Oasis Church, they're going to be loved and welcomed. I do think we are welcoming. But what have we done to reach out to those people? Jesus sent his disciples out. And it didn't take him long. Like there was the Sermon on the Mount. There was, a, a, I don't know, it doesn't say how long, maybe a few months of this is what it looks like. And then he sent them out two by two to go uh, preach the gospel. To, he sent them out to all these different cities to reach the lost, to reach the people that need Jesus. So for me, the what now is just asking myself that question. What can I do? What can I do to reach out to the outcasts in our society? It, the, the outcasts, the, the people on the fringes, um, the people that don't feel welcome anywhere, let alone the church. How can we be loving those people? Ask yourself that question and be ready. Pray for that. Ask God, I want opportunities to reach out to those people and then be obedient, trust and obey. So the next what now after that is just read Matthew chapter 11 and 12 and be ready for next week as we continue to study and, and learn from this book together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, um, thank you for your word and thank you for the way that it reveals the truth of who we are and who you are. And I pray um, that Oasis would be a place where everyone is welcome. It would also be a place where we were sent out, where we were inspired, where we are inspired, equipped, and released to go to our neighborhoods, to go to the far reaches of our society, to, to, to love whoever we come across, and to bring them into the kingdom of heaven. So they could know you and have a place to belong. We love you, Jesus. And we, we do fall far short of this beautiful picture your Bible paints. I just pray that, that every day we'd be one step closer. And we would trust that what you said is right. Not our, not our perfect image of community, but your perfect image of community. That's what we're seeking after. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace Amen 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 Amen, Amen. Amen.
children, their children, their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. Your family, your children, your children, their children. Their children. 